I'm sure you've seen QR codes. You might be quite familiar with them. They're, they're usually in kind of a square, and they got a bunch of little square lines or boxes inside of them. Well, they are being used now to hack you and your bank account. So my tip in the newsletter this week is how not to get hacked by a QR code because they are being used for a lot of things. And you think of a QR code, you might think of, oh, that uh, sign on the bus stop, right, for the for the lawyer that's chasing ambulances, right? Because you've seen them there before, we all have, or in other public places. But it is those, and it's also now ending up in our emails. We've had to make some major changes to our email filters because of that. They are emailing QR codes. So people are scanning, they pull out the phone, whip out the whole QR code, I know what that is, and scan it. And then before you know it, there are problems. So they are becoming very popular, which means that the bad guys are going to use them, right? They're going to try and hose every dollar out of your account that they can possibly get their fingers on. And, you know, restaurants are using them, especially during the lockdown. There are a lot of restaurants that did not have menus. They had a little sticker on the table with a QR code that you'd scan. Well, some of those QR codes have been replaced by malicious QR codes. And and how are you going to know the difference? Well, bottom line, a QR code is really just a, what's called, called a URL. It's a URL link. It's a universal resource locator link. And that means it will take you to a website or maybe it'll open an email for you. It'll do a whole bunch of different things. There's a lot of things that QR codes can do. But those little squares that are inside the bigger square, or sometimes it's rectangles, are in fact just codes that can be easily read by a camera, a smartphone, and converted into the URL. And this is explained in detail if you want it in this week's newsletter. And you can always find it on my website as well. Just search for Craig Peterson space QR codes. But here's what you have to be aware of here you got to approach these things with caution you wouldn't just type in www.internetbadguys.com would you well actually you should to see if if it's properly tagged right internet bad guys is a website that's used by cisco and some others to determine whether or not the url is known to be malicious so i just typed it into my computer and my company mainstream comes up and it says mainstream managed security this site is blocked due to a phishing threat internetbadguys.com so i i I don't think you would type in internetbadguys.com unless you're testing to make sure that your web browser and you your dns are safe right but uh, you you might want to do it anyways but just check it out but you're not going to type it in because you're going to say wait a minute now why would i go to destroy my bank account destroy my credit rating destroy my you wouldn't go there so what they're doing is they're taking QR code generators, which you can get. They come with pretty much every computer, every graphics program that's out there nowadays, and have that program then generate one of those nice little squares with the squares and rectangles and stuff, and generate that and print it up, and it takes you to their evil scheme. In fact, that's exactly what I have in the newsletter, evilscheme.com slash promo. So, How do you know? Is it legit? Is it really the restaurant? Is it really the attorney? Is it really whatever it might be, right? They they have them at the gym uh, in the locker room. They have them kind of everywhere. Well, here's the trick, because public spaces particularly are prime targets for these nasty QR codes that are out there. And I've got a little story in the newsletter about Sarah, and she thought her bases were all covered, and then it turned out that they weren't, and there was a problem, a pretty big problem. And you you can read that in there. But she scanned a fake QR code. I've talked before about how the hackers are going out there, and instead of hosing the money out of your bank account, they're using your computer or your smartphone to do things like a Bitcoin mining as an example 
And that's what ended up happening with Sarah. And so that, that story talks about what can happen to you too if you do it. So they are being sent in the email. I mentioned that one already. And the, the problem with them being sent in the email is that a lot of the anti-spam, anti-phishing email programs that are trying to clean up your email don't look at the graphics now more and more of them have been looking at it they're looking for things like high skin content so that they can detect it, that this is a pornographic picture and block it some are definitely checking for qr codes and then they'll look for those known bad urls phishing urls like internet badguys.com but a lot of them don't, right? So if you've ever seen a QR code in your email, you know it's probably not being filtered properly. And if you're responsible for the email for your company, make sure you get a QR code filter in place in order to protect the business because this is this is a very big deal. Now, there are QR code scanners that you can get. I remember I had one years ago when QR codes first started becoming uh, moderately popular and it was not built into my phone. So I had to run the app. I think it was called Red Laser or something way back when. And I would run that app and that app would just go ahead and take control of the camera and it would read the QR code and it would tell you what the QR code is. It would then compare. For instance, if you scanned a UPC code, it would understand a UPC and it would compare it with other products or other vendors. So you knew where to get the best deal. Well, nowadays, if you've got a reasonably new smartphone, you can bet that your camera has built into it, that camera app, the ability to decode QR codes. So uh, one of the pro tips that I have in the newsletter is to stick with well-known, highly rated QR code scanning apps because there's still reasons to use those third-party apps like for doing the comparisons that I mentioned before. But because it's built into your phone, people have more access to reading those QR codes, but that doesn't mean that it's safer. Just having the ability to have a QR code reader doesn't mean that that reader is very smart. So you should also have various filters in place on your mobile devices to block some of this stuff. But here's the basics. So, for instance, on my iPhone, and I think from the polls that I've done, most of you guys are using iPhones, but this applies to Android as well. If you see a QR code and you feel compelled to check out that QR code, you point your camera at the QR code and then the camera app will come up with the URL with the URL that you will be taken to if you decide to click on it so on the iPhone for instance it does not automatically just take you to that website and the same thing's true for the latest versions of Android operating system right so you scan the QR code it doesn't automatically take you there Okay, great. Now what do you do? Well, now it should be showing you the QR code's URL equivalent. So it should be showing you that that URL there, the Internet Bad Guys URL. Uh, Can you see where the problem comes in, though? Because sometimes those URLs are legitimate, but they don't point directly to the company. So they'll use a tracker of some sort. And you might notice that in my newsletters. If you look at the URLs that I send you to, if you just hover your mouse over them, you'll see it's I'm using a third-party company that actually sends my emails, delivers them, keeps track of what people are interested in, so I know what to include in future emails. It's marketing, right? And it's something that is perfectly legitimate. So my URL in my newsletter is not craigpeterson.com. It may look like it on the screen, right? That's what the link says. And that's where it will ultimately take you. And you can actually type that URL in by hand. But if you mouse over that URL, you'll see it's taking you through a third party that then tracks okay so we have a lot of people who are interested in qr codes for instance so maybe we should talk more about that or do something else all of that stuff can be viewed 
on that QR code screen when you're scanning it, and then you have to make the educated decision about whether or not you actually want to open up that URL, because that's what it's going to do. It's going to take you there. So privacy, yeah, there's some potential issues because you you can be tracked. And again, from a marketing standpoint, I think that's okay because I look at it and say, well, if if I'm looking for a truck right now to buy, I want to see ads for my F-150, right? It's great that they know that I'm interested in buying something. Uh, Yet on the other hand, do we really want all of that information to be put into a database that a data broker is going to sell to whomever, including governments out there? The U.S. government is a massive customer of these data brokers because they can't collect the data themselves. They just go out and they buy it from these uh, open source companies or for, from data bro- brokers. They're actually paying for the data. So, you know, you got to make that decision yourself. But be very careful with QR codes because ultimately you may not have any idea where they're taking you online. Hey, you'll find this and more every week. You know, I put out my newsletter. You can get it absolutely for free. Just go to Craig peterson.com it's right there on the home page in fact it is the home page and uh, once you sign up you'll get the free weekly newsletters including this week's newsletter and all of the future ones craig peterson.com we have a very electric based economy right electricity it's used for almost everything and now of course we're trying to use it for vehicles as well to move stuff around including moving us around so we've got a few problems to solve here first of all there is a dramatically in dramatic increase in the amount of electricity we need as well as a decrease in a lot of areas of the world a decrease in the amount of energy electricity available because they're shutting down various types of power plants coal power gas power power plants they're putting up unreliable things like wind and solar very expensive means of producing electricity and of course they've been driving up the cost of fuel on purpose as president biden it's not not biden obama said right it's necessary the gas be eight dollars a gallon and that's what biden's been working on as well driving up the price of gas so while all of this is happening and we're trying to put electric cars on the road and as i've said many times it is not the world's not ready for it it's absolutely kind of crazy to be trying to do anything like that right now so as we're doing that guess what else is increasing the demand for electricity for our computing Right. Have you ever used chat GPT or BARD or any of these other artificial intelligences? They're really kind of cool, right? It's really machine learning. It doesn't really have intelligence. But when you get behind the scenes, you'll see there's a lot of money going into it. For instance, Microsoft has put over $10 billion into OpenAI. They're the guys that came up with chat GPT. Well, ChatGPT, pretty good, does a lot of neat things. ChatGPT 4 is pretty amazing. And ChatGPT 5 apparently is going to blow us away. Some people are saying it is reaching what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence, where it can draw its own conclusions and use bits of data that it has learned or acquired in order to figure out things that it was not told about. So basically be kind of like a a human mind. But all of this is drawing electricity, a whole lot of power out there. A single data center can use as much electricity as hundreds of thousands of homes. And those data centers that are running things like OpenAI or so many other artificial intelligence projects that are out there right now, those data centers are dramatic, dramatically increasing in the amount of power that they use. So you go online and you do a search on Google or DuckDuckGo or maybe Bing or one of these other, just a normal search engine. Don't use, pull any any of their ML, AI types 
stuff into the mix, that search on Google.com is going to use a, a fair amount of electricity, frankly, for that one little search. And then they're adding AI to it. And AI can use hundreds of times as much electricity as non-AI systems for doing searches. And yet that's what we're doing. I know I do that, right? I'll be trying to write an article for you guys to put into the weekly newsletter, and I want to do a little research on it. And, of course, I'll use DuckDuckGo. I'll use Google. I'll use BARD. I'll use OpenAI and put it all together and put in my own opinion, right? And there's a lot of stuff the AI misses that I want to make sure that is put into the the whole mix there in the article. So it still requires my a dramatic amount of my human interaction in fact when i use these tools for programming what i found is that it it does kind of increase my efficiency about 40 percent but every bit of code i've ever gotten out of any of these had bugs had some major problems in some cases so you know it, it's just not ready quite yet but it's still using hundreds of times as much electricity so when we get down to it if we're going to be carbon neutral, and you know, you could certainly argue about man caused global warming, right, or climate change, which everything I've seen, all of the studies really show that's not the case. We, we are such a minor contribution, far less than 1% of the any sort of climate change is caused by humans now of course local things that's a little different right we can obviously change the climate by cutting down forests or putting up forests in fact there's there's a movement now to stop the planting of trees in some areas because what's happening is they're putting in all of these wonderful little trees and they're putting them in to areas where that tree is not natural so it's choking out the natural vegetation in the area as well as the natural trees. So, you know, again, unintended consequences. But anyways, we need more electricity as we move more into this artificial intelligence future. So how are we going to do that? A really good question. We're not going to be able to do that with solar panels. We're not going to be able to do that with windmills. Not a chance. Well, these smaller modular reactors called SMRs are really the future, certainly for the immediate future here. And these are basically a, a power plant that will power a neighborhood. They can, they can be bigger than that, right? They can power a whole data center, which is equivalent to hundreds of thousands of homes. But there's problems with those. And the biggest problem isn't the safety, because now we're using physics to make sure that it will never melt down. It can't melt down. It, these new plants don't have to have pumps that are running all of the time. So you can't get a Fukushima. You cannot get a Chernobyl. You cannot get a Three Mile Island. These plants it cannot happen. So we need these plants how do we get them? Well, we have to go through the approval process. The Nuclear Regulatory Agency is out there. They have been using these rules, some of which are more than 50 years old, to rate these brand new types of technology. And, you know, it's true with any organization, any bureaucracy, and it is especially true for our federal bureaucracy. Those bureaucracies just take on more and more power and authority, give themselves more power and authority uh, all of the time, right? Which is, frankly, a, a pretty huge problem when you get right down to it, right? So there is a company that is trying to get approval, and they finally got approval for one of these small modular reactors. It's called New Scale Power. You'll find them online, NU Scale, all one word, NU Scale Power. And kind of a cool little company. Right now it's trading at about three and a half bucks a share, give or take. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm not giving investment advice, but it's not one of these huge companies that's out there. That's what my point, right? You're not paying a few hundred dollars a share for it. So let's talk about what New Scale had to go through in order to get some form of approval. Well, uh, here we go. There's one developer that's gone through this process, and it got its design approved, and it cost New Scale around a half a 
billion dollars to get approval. Half a billion, 500 million U.S. dollars. And its application was 12,000 pages long and had around 2 million pages of support materials behind it. Pretty, pretty big deal, isn't it? So we're, we're going to talk about how that collapsed and who else is looking at this nuclear power and also that this COP summit that the United Nations just had, the U.S. as well as other countries have signed on to triple the amount of nuclear power they're generating. <laughs> yeah, some people seem to be waking up. Make sure you're on my newsletter list so you get this newsletter as well as others for free, craigpeterson.com. You know, I'm kind of thinking maybe they've been listening to my show for the last 20 years because I've been talking about this a long time. But yes, they are trying to get it to the point where we have dramatically more nuclear power because these things are so safe. But when we're talking about this one SMR developer, New Scale Power, and the fact that it cost them a half a billion dollars to get a design approved, 12,000 page application, 2 million pages of support materials, it is absolutely nuts, right? Who can do that? Well, and then to top it off, plans for New Scale's first commercial product project, according to the Wall Street Journal, collapsed last month when a group of utilities in the Mountain West couldn't get enough members to sign up. So they were trying to get these various utility companies to pony up and buy this nuclear power. You know, I, I keep thinking about what happened with the Seabrook plant in New Hampshire. Beautiful, great design. You know, it, it's not as good as these new SMRs, no question about it. Uh, because these new plants are just basically stamped out at a factory. But the the plant where they had planned on bringing on multiple reactors, not only did they not bring on multiple reactors, they ended up decommissioning uh, the, the primary reactor. Now, it, it, it's insane what we've been doing here. And I can understand people saying, well, we don't want a nuclear power plant next to our house. You know, NIMBY is a big problem. It, that's the reason why we don't have windmills off of Cape Cod, right? Not in my backyard. Not when I have money. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to bring lawyers. Or I don't have money. I'm going to be out there with picket signs. I'm going to have all my friends chanting and chaining themselves to the gates. And so these businesses, like uh, what happened out in the mountain west here when these utilities decided not to go with this said well what's our cost of doing business here and consider that just the half a billion dollars to get the approval it just boggles the mind absolutely boggles the mind oh my gosh anyhow they are working on some uh, some other projects as well. They're trying to go domestically overseas, all of these different plans. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has plans to host an international meeting on AI next year. Now, this is interesting because AI is part of the reason we need so much power. And when you get right down to it, there, there's some very interesting concepts, man, we could talk about for a long time. But one of the big ones is kind of like the Star Trek universe. If if you're a Trekker, and I've watched every episode of all of the Star Trek's everythings, right? Uh, you know that it's a future society that's portrayed, and basically nobody has to work as a rule, right? Some people do, some people don't. And now you've got people who are working in the the ships, right, that are flying around the universe. But the bottom line is the energy is almost completely free, and they can turn energy into physical material. So think about the replicators that they have. So it needs power, and that power then can be turned into food or a part for a machine or almost anything. So what Elon Musk is proposing is something I've been saying for a very, very long time. At some point, 
the machines, including the artificial intelligences, are going to be able to provide us all with a universal, not basic income, but a universal high income. We're a long ways away from this, people, so don't get me wrong here when I'm talking about this. This is I'm not talking about some socialist utopia where there's a few people at the top, like the Bidens, that make millions of dollars and the rest of us down one paycheck away from bankruptcy, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to have almost infinite amount of power, very inexpensively, having that power be able to be used by artificial and general intelligence to solve real problems like illnesses, like food growth and people who, who starve in the streets. And being able to, at that point, also turn some of that energy into something material which by the way there are already lab experiments underway and some success in that realm so that's a future that is going to happen but it's as i said it's a long ways away before it happens and of course you also have the problem of the dictators out there the most of the countries in the world the vast majority of member states in the united nations are uh, despots they are dictators dictatorships de facto or otherwise and uh, how are you going to stop those guys from taking the the newfound power literal power and using it to amass more wealth power and strength for themselves and steer the country in a direction that's going to benefit them as opposed to benefit everybody else that's always the problem right how how do you go to the most exclusive retirement home in the world, i.e. the U.S. Senate, and now you are all of a sudden a multimillionaire? And that's true for many House members as well. Do you think those people are, are not going to start grabbing on to the money, uh, the power? Of course they will, right? That's what they do. Joe Biden's been in the Senate since it was legal for him, based on his age, to be in the Senate, right? He ran for office and won when he was 29, if I remember correctly, and didn't start serving till he was 30. So all of that, let's push that aside for now. Let's get back to nuclear power, which is the reality of where we're at today. It is clean. These new nuclear power plants have enough fuel right now to operate at our electrical consumption needs for 100 to 150 years in the U.S. right now without mining anything new. Some of these nuclear power plants, they actually burn the waste from the old power plants that we have been storing. Now, I'm using the term burn loosely. Obviously, they don't burn that stuff, but they process it and they, they use it for generating more power. So it's, it's incredible. It's incredible it's stuff we should be doing, if only for the reason of getting rid of some of the old radioactive materials that are out there. But with AI, with the need for data centers and the high cost of electricity in most of the world, Microsoft is now talking about building their own nuclear plant to power their own data centers in order to power artificial intelligence, open AI. So that was kind of a, a long chiasmic loop there, frankly, but that's what's going on. We will see more nuclear power. We have to have nuclear power. I think we are way early on electric cars, and it's obvious that the market's waking up to that. People aren't buying them like they used to. Way, way down, better than 20% price drops in some areas of electric vehicles and we they are highly polluting they may have no exhaust coming out of the pipe but every other part from the manufacturer through the through generation electricity is highly polluting and yet people are so short-sighted so if you haven't bought an electric car good for you i get it if you have bought an electric car damn those things are cool <laughs> Okay, but, uh, you know, bottom line is I haven't spent a dime on them and I don't plan on it because, again, federal government picking a winner. Are you kidding me? Right. Uh, there's a big movement right now for having ammonia power for cars. Uh, there's a lot we could do and we're not exploring thanks to the uh, retirement home that is the U.S. Senate and the House. 
in the presidential office, I guess. Hey, make sure you get my weekly newsletter for free. Sign up, craigpeterson.com. The biggest threats right now to small and medium businesses. So that means, you know, small business is up to about $20 million. I think a medium business is up to $100 million. So if you're under the $100 million mark, listen up here. Because the biggest threats right now are, number one, some of these scripting frameworks, and number two, business email compromise scams. These things are absolutely huge. So uh, this is an article from HelpNet Security, and they are quoting that, uh, here you go, attackers deployed malware in 44% of the cases, but the remaining 56% of incidences including included what's called living off the land binaries, so LOL bins, scripting frameworks such as PowerShell and remote monitoring and management software. And that's a really big one that's gotten nailed last year. You might remember the whole solar winds attack. So, uh, and that, by the way, is what most of the managed services providers are using is and we use an rmm framework okay so let's explain this a little bit microsoft has always been in a game of catch-up you know they started out he he sold bill gates sold to ibm an operating system that bill gates didn't even have bill gates hadn't even barely even thought about it and he sold them an operating system. He sold them, signed the contracts. And then he had to run around and try and find an operating system that he could uh, then call MS-DOS. And the whole Seattle Software Works thing he bought for, I think it was $50,000. Uh, and then off he goes, right? So from the very, very beginning, they've been playing catch up. He got the whole idea of the windowing stuff from Xerox Park. Xerox at Palo Alto Research Center had a, just an amazing system way ahead of its time. And so did Steve Jobs. He modeled the Apple user interface after some of the ideas that came out of Xerox Park. Again, not something that Bill Gates came up with or, or did. He just had his people copy it. Uh, and not do a very good job at it either. But you know what I think about Microsoft. So um, Unix computers have had some serious advantages for a very long time. Unix was started really in the 1960s is where it started. And it was designed as an operating system that Ma Bell could use, the, the Bell operating companies, the phone company basically could use and could use it on all of their computers because they had computers that had been around for a long time and they wanted a single operating system that they could kind of run everywhere. And there's a bunch of background here too with Multics and other things. I get it, right? We're making this pretty simple. But that's where Unix came from. And then in the 1970s, Bell figured out, hey, wait a minute now, uh, we're giving all of this hardware to universities and universities have even more hardware than what we've given them. And they're all different. They all run different operating systems. So how about we give them a license to Unix? And so that's where uh, the some the version five, seven uh, of really version seven Unix came from. And then it was grown commercially into system five, et cetera. And it grew up in that environment, in the university environment and in the networked environment, which is exactly what Bell was doing, the phone company. All of the phone lines that we had, even in the 70s, were actually digital behind the scenes. It was amazing what they were doing. And then when the universities had it, of course, they had to network their computers. So all of the networking we're using today was developed in the Unix world. It really was was and of course 
we could talk about fringe cases, but it really was. And the security that was put in place was for the universities to secure their systems from their students who were constantly trying to break in, change grades, get whatever they could out of these things, right? So it was designed to be very robust. In fact, the internet was designed so that it could withstand a nuclear attack. You could wipe out major portions of the internet, and yet the internet would still work. BGP today, that um, border gateway protocol that we use and that I'm a part of and have been for decades now, that, that BGP allows the internet to reroute all of the traffic depending on what, uh, what availability there is. If part of it goes offline, it's incredibly robust. And then along meanders Bill Gates and Microsoft saying, oh, well, we got we to gotta do something about this. And they, they bought a license to, um, what was it called? I think it was Spider, Spider Networks. I think they're out of um, uh, the UK, actually Ireland, if I remember correctly. And Spider, I worked on that code, right? I helped to fix that code. I worked in Microsoft's kernel. I, I worked on Windows NT, the very first versions out there, the 351 and all of that stuff. That was me. I was in all of that stuff, okay? But Microsoft never did anything right from an engineering standpoint, ever. You know, marketing, yeah, oh, you check all of the boxes. You, you, if you're old enough, you remember how terrible all of the Microsoft Office software was. And it kind of remains that way today, right? So Microsoft tried to get into the Internet game oh, 20 years after everybody else was into it, and they didn't do a very good job on it. And, and now Microsoft is, hey, yeah, yeah, you pay us 20 bucks a month per person, and uh, we'll give you all of the Office software. We'll give you a Windows license. Oh, and, and you can use Teams, and you can use um, email, Microsoft email, and all of it has serious problems when it comes to all of the networking stuff. It's just crazy. So our, our friends in the Unix world, and I've been in the Unix world heavily since about 1980, all, all the Unix world had a, the concept of a shell. Now, remember, Microsoft, it, it, certainly it had a shell back in the MS-DOS days, right? And then they moved away from that. Everything needed to be managed via the interface, right? The GUI, graphical user interface with the mouse and point and click and things and, and move everything around. That's how it all had to be managed. And then Microsoft finally came to realize, wait a minute now, um, maybe there's better ways to do this. And and I I have to just shake my head um i have a, one of my two of my kids actually work for banks and they had what they called the dark side and the the dark side was the computer system that had ibm mainframes behind it and it was all cli it was all command line interface it was all the shell and you could just you type in the command and ta-da there's your answer Versus the windowing interface where you had to click on this and then click on that and click on this and click on that. So it was much easier to train people to click on stuff on a Windows, Microsoft Windows interface than it was to train someone what those command lines were. And yet it was way faster to use the command lines. It was ran way faster. You could get way more information. You could get very specific information that you could never get on the Windows apps. And then what do the banks do? Well, they eventually fade away from the mainframes in the back end. They put screen scrapers on them and stuff and make it all Windows. So at the same time, Microsoft finally realized Windows is terrible. Yeah, yeah. If, if you really want to do work, if you really want to administer a computer, no, no, no. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to go and click around everywhere. And they came up with PowerShell. So they, again, ripped off the concept and had a I would argue a poor implementation of it. Now, PowerShell today has a lot of powerful features in it. There's no question about it. It, it is not of itself buggy. So I don't want you to get that concept, right? It's not like the up to version 5 of Word, which was just terribly buggy, and then up to version 10 before they finally fine-tuned it, right? Um, but they finally adopted shells. And now there's stuff that you can only do via PowerShell. 
in Windows. You can't you can't even get at it through any of their window interfaces, their admin interfaces. Uh, it, it, you just can't do it. So I told you all of that so I can tell you this. The PowerShell, as implemented by Microsoft, is giving you access to almost everything, and the hosers know it. So rather than installing software on your computer that is identifiable malware, they are using tools that use PowerShell in such a way that you're in deep trouble. So Microsoft, of course, is not a Unix space. Apple is. If you're using a Mac, you've got Unix behind you. You've got those decades now. What? We're up to seven decades, six, uh, five or six decades worth of experience with networks and with attacking and with protection and everything else, right? Uh, not true for PowerShell. Not true for PowerShell. So the bad guys, 60% of the time are using, 65% according to this article from HelpNet Security, are using this poor implementation of a shell called PowerShell in order to get into your computers and take things over. It's absolutely insane. Now, these RMM tools, remote management tools, are legitimate software. But when they're used for intrusion purposes, they can easily evade anti-malware protection and literally blend into the environment. And that's why we use Cisco's anti-malware platforms in order to help protect systems, because it does specifically look for some of these things, right? Absolutely, absolutely amazing here. Uh, in some cases, they've observed adversaries diversifying among several RMM tools, such as using a combination of commercial and open source items to ensure redundant access to victim environments. This is a problem. It's a problem I'm working on uh, for my customers. You can never be 100%. But if you're running Windows, you are guaranteed to be extremely vulnerable, at least for today. Just as a, a word to the wise. Ah, oh, man, switch to a Mac, switch to Unix, switch to stuff that is field proven for many, many decades. All right. Online, CraigPeterson.com. And I got that off my chest. I feel so much better right now. I've had this email address now that I am still using for more than 30 years, a very long time. So I get a lot of emails. And I thought, well, maybe it was just me because I've been using this email address since I think, yeah, 92, give or take. So uh, why am I getting these and are other people getting them? And, and I've asked around a little bit and got some feedback. Yeah, it's happening. And then I had a couple of calls from clients, and this is what's got me concerned here over the last week, and that is apparently these are spreading like wildfire. I had one client who has a new accountant, and she called me up because she got an email, and she wasn't quite sure if it was legitimate or not. It was an invoice, and it was an invoice for one of the buildings that they have. They have three locations saying that they owed I think it was like six or maybe eight hundred dollars in order to get heating oil this winter and they needed to pay it right away and at the top it had a legitimate business name and the logo and in fact if you went to online you did a search for that business name sure enough they came up and yeah it's the same logo but when she dug in a little bit deeper she found that it had a different phone number on the invoice than was on their website. And that's when she started to really start to wonder and gave us a call. Now, we looked with some detail at the headers on the email. You might be familiar with email headers. They can usually be used to dig in and find out which server did they originate from that email, what servers did it go through, what kind of anti-spam testing was applied to it, and, you know, putting all of that stuff together. And it's important to do all of that, frankly, to have a close look at it. So that's what we did. And we found out, okay, wait a minute here. This came from a Microsoft-hosted 
domain. Now remember Microsoft with the Microsoft 365 crazy, bad, ridiculous product, <laughs> not that I have an opinion on the matter, allows small businesses to set up their own email domain and life is good from that point on, except that of course their security is just being under so much heavy fire for very very good reason particularly if you only buy the base licenses from microsoft we've talked before about how microsoft 365 doesn't guarantee that your data is going to stay intact that it isn't going to be lost microsoft has lost data from some very big corporations who sued them and the the corporations lost in court microsoft won because it's quite clear yeah we don't do backups of your data anyhow <laughs> The, the emails that ended up in the hands of the accountant were legitimately delivered from a Microsoft hosted domain. So when you look at it, even when you're digging in from the technical side, the emails all looked okay going all the way through. So somebody spent some time on this. And so when the accountant called me up, I asked her, hey, is this a company you've dealt with before? Now, remember, she was a new accountant at this client. And the new accountant said, I, oh, I don't really know. And I told her, well, the first thing to do is check to see if this is a, an actual vendor, right? Do they actually deliver the heating oil to the office? And if they do, then maybe it might be legitimate. But ask them if it's a legitimate invoice or not. And so, okay, so she did that. And uh, they said no. And I also told her, well, ask the business owner, if you don't know, and see if he has an idea about this. And he said, no, they are not a legitimate uh, provider for us. So when she called them up, she told them, hey, listen, somebody's sending out invoices on what looks to be your letterhead, if you will, your invoice head with your logo representing as you and is trying to get me to pay the bill. So I dug into that more and I wrote a really kind of a detailed article here about my favorite ways to protect yourself from falling victim to these types of scams. And I've got right in there, if you go, you have to click through from the newsletter to my website, but there's, there's six different points. And I try to make them unique, right? There's the obvious ones, and I try not to emphasize those because we talk about it so much, but, you know, using unique passwords and stuff. But with something like this, how do you know if it's a legitimate email, a legitimate invoice? I've got all kinds of samples. I've just been saving all of these phishing emails for years. So I've got many, many samples, and some of these samples are from PayPal, supposedly, where I need to uh, pay my PayPal invoice. Others have been for Bitcoin that I bought, and I needed to Venmo some money over for Bitcoin, and, and some of the others as well. There are thousands of these people out there who are trying to get you to send them money. So I want to really warn you about it. It is out there. It is a big deal. Do not give out any personal information unless you're the one that has initiated contact with what's effectively a trusted source. So how do you do that? Well, it's old school, everybody. When you're looking at the invoice, look old school. Even though the invoice may come in in an email, it may have a PDF and some people print them up and, you know, still do the old paperwork on them. But double check to make sure it's correct. Another thing that we've seen is invoices have been stolen. So it's the, the invoice template, if you will, or the emails that had that PDF in it or the invoices in it. So the account was compromised. And th I've seen this. It, it, it's happening. It could happen to you. And then what the bad guys do is they put onto the bottom of this this little message that says, oh, our ACH number has changed. If, if you're an accountant, 
you know what that is, a bookkeeper or business owner, because that's the way you can transfer funds directly for very little cost. It's not like wiring money. It's nowhere near as expensive. And it's almost instant as well. It's pretty darn quick. So what they'll do is they'll take the invoice, a legitimate invoice from a legitimate vendor of yours, and they'll modify that so that at the bottom it has maybe a different bank account number or it says like the one that I just saw that they've changed their ACH destination and here it is. So you then think, oh, I thought I paid that invoice or maybe I haven't paid it yet. Then you send the money to the bad guys directly. The money goes very, very quickly. According to the FBI, once it's in the bad guy's hands, it's usually out of the country in about 90 seconds. And many of these bad guys own banks. Isn't that crazy? So if you're trying to claw that money back, once it hits their bank, it's gone. Right? You'll never, ever see it again. So initiate a phone call yourself. Call them up on the phone. You, you don't have to use that rotary dial phone or that touch tone phone that may be hiding somewhere there in the office, right? You can use your smartphone, your cell phone, but look them up online again, right? We don't have yellow pages or white pages anymore. Although I, I did get one a couple of years ago. It was kind of surprising. And it was from a third party. It wasn't a real, if you will, yellow pages from the phone company. But look them up online. Give them a call. Maintain a relationship with the vendors that way, okay? Now, if anybody calls claiming to be from a company asking for sensitive data, especially if it appears out of place, don't provide them with anything until their identity has been verified independently through official channels. Now, I had an interesting call this week, too. One of my, uh, my people who does tech support called up a client and told the client, hey, I'm from Mainstream, and uh, well, I had to make a couple of changes to your email account. So I have a, had to reset your password. I have a new password for you. Uh, are you ready to take it down? Okay, there you go. Thanks. And then afterwards, she realized, you know, maybe that other person, because they seemed a little edgy, thought um, maybe this was a scam call. Maybe mainstream wasn't really their provider, right? They're, we have some clients that are pretty big. Not all of the employees have ever heard, even heard of us before. And when, when it boiled down to it, though, it wasn't my tech calling up, asking them for their password, because she didn't. It was my tech calling up and telling them what their new password was. So you see the difference? So a call like she made can be perfectly legitimate. In fact, it was legitimate. But calls where they call you up and ask for your password are not. And I have seen that where they say, hey, we're doing upgrades. We're going to upgrade your Windows, your Word, whatever it is this weekend. And so I just need your username and password so I can log into your computer and check it after we're all done. And guess what? Yeah, it was the bad guys, right? Those hosers trying to hose all of that money out of your account. Hey, I want you to get this list of things that you can do to protect yourself from these types of scams. It's absolutely free. You can go to my website at craigpeterson.com. But I have things like this, tips every week that you can get for free by going to craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. Get my insider show notes and my tips, craigpeterson.com slash subscribe right now. So I guess our first question is, do you know what doxing is? It's been around since the early 1990s. It's kind of an internet trend. And it's where people go and try and find information about you, for instance. And the main idea behind it is to kind of publicly embarrass people. Now, there are some guidances out there about how you can protect yourself, what you should do to protect yourself from doxing, but they're looking for things like your real name, your address, job, phone number, other identifying information. It's PII is what it's considered, personally identifiable information. And they'll 
often take that information and public leap hosted online on different kinds of community forums reddit's one of the popular ones nothing wrong with reddit per se it, it's just a place where they'll post all of this personal information so that they can shame you or embarrass you or in some cases come after you with criminal intent now speaking of criminal it is illegal to dock someone in california if it rises to the level of online harassment but personal information that's publicly available is and legally obtained obviously is typically not a crime in most states now where doxing has really shown up and bothers me maybe even the most isn't public figure so much although obviously it happens you know we've seen these protesters in front of supreme court justices homes if you're a left-wing protester you can be right there in front of the house if you're a right wing wing protester you got to be a few blocks away from the house but in either case they know where the justice lives and how about your kids or grandkids where are they in the doxing scale well you know there's a lot of mean kids out there and i was bullied growing up i probably almost everybody was bullied by somebody and i had a problem they knew where i lived and they would get me uh coming to school usually in the morning sometimes coming home from school in the evening and it, it got pretty bad they pulled two by fours on me i had knife pulled and put to my throat just all kinds of stuff right so that's a problem but at least i could try and alter my way home to get around the bullies it didn't last my, my the, for the whole school experience right and they moved on they got bored and life was okay at that point but how about our kids and grandkids who have smartphones and have people at school that were elsewhere that really don't like them that want to embarrass them that want to harass them they can't get away from those phones they are addictive quite literally addictive and i've read some studies on the chemicals and the chemical interactions but the chemicals that are released in your brain that that cause you to really become addicted and how many people do you see that are scrolling through messages or who are playing video games all of the time you know as much as they possibly can it's a real big deal so doxing which is also sometimes called dropping docs documents right doxing is a problem so I, I went online and looked up a little bit more and I wrote an article about it as well so you can find out a little bit more but I love this article from 404 media co and it is talking about doxing and the problems that you can run into uh, here's a picture that they have on their website that again i've got a link to it in my newsletter but it's a photo of a mask it's got this black mask and a box of of uh, 45 auto rounds okay and the, it, it's meant to be a threat to whomever that was sent to and you know it can just be a stupid kid being stupid and but it could also be something legitimate that you've got to be careful of so this guy who wrote the article said he went on to telegram he went into a telegram channel that is known for doxing that's where you go if you want to find out the information about somebody and he entered in their name and the state that he believed this person lived in and hit enter and then the bot spat out a file containing every address that person had ever lived at in the u.s all the way back to their college dorm more than a decade earlier the file included the names and birth years of the relatives it listed the target's mobile phone numbers and provider as well as personal email addresses finally the file contained information from their driver's license including its unique identification number all of that cost 15 dollars in bitcoin and the bot also offers if they have it the social security number too for twenty dollars 
Can you imagine that? And for you to get your reputation back after someone has stolen your identity can take you 300 hours. And most of the time, people don't even bother trying to get it all cleared up unless, of course, there's been theft or they, you know, they bought a house in your name or they sold your house that you're living in because they have all that information. Where does this come from? And that's the interesting part to me. We know that the credit bureaus like Experian and Equifax and TransUnion, those are the three big ones, have all of this information. All right. Well, it's supposed to be kept confidential, isn't it? Well, we're not going to get into Equifax and the massive hack that they had. They lost, I think it was over 200 million people's personal information okay so that's one way the bad guys can get it they can get it on the dark web they can buy one of these data dumps or thefts but through what he, this author here at 404media.co is saying through a complex web of agreements and purchases that data trickles down from the credit bureaus to other companies who offer it to debt collectors insurance companies and law enforcement we've talked before here about how federal agencies including the fbi who are not allowed to track us and get personal information and keep those files unless they've got an explicit reason right they have reason to suspect uh, but they're still not allowed to collect a lot, lot of that data they just go to these places and buy it isn't that amazing so this particular uh, telegram channel has tapped into that okay uh, they've they've gotten some of this data apparently by stealing former law enforcement officers identity and they're selling unfettered access to the criminal cohorts online Isn't that something so if you want to find out where the cop that arrested you uh, lives uh, what the job is where he's been his wife children aunts uncles brothers sisters you can probably find it so they tested it looking for information on elon musk joe rogan joe biden and uh, it got it it got it and 404 media this is this again this website verified that although not always sensitive at least some of that data is accurate wow eh so there are some of these communities that the tools advertised in include these swatting rooms where people will call 911 and coerce a SWAT team to get involved, right? To go on out and break down your door and yeah, then the nastiness happens. So be very, very careful online. Make sure you get my newsletter. This was in the newsletter. Don't miss the next one. They're absolutely free. I'm not pushing something on you. I'm just trying to keep you informed. Go online to craigpeterson.com slash subscribe right now and sign up right there, craigpeterson.com. I think I should start by kind of explaining a little bit more about what's going on with these wonderful credit reporting agencies. Basically, what they've done is they've come up with a way around the laws as they stand. And they're getting around those, obviously, so they can make some extra money, right? That, that's my opinion, but I think it's pretty obvious to almost anybody. And TransUnion, for instance, is aware of its brand recognition in the criminal underground. Uh, TransUnion said, at times, fraudsters will pull data from other sources and misrepresent it as as uh, our data uh yeah okay but here's the problem above all of that stuff there is on top of all of this this mechanism that they have set up that allows people businesses and others to be able to get at some of this information and it, it, it's more or less legal okay so this is a bit of a problem but these criminals have access to a tool over at TransUnion called TLOXP. And the direct relationship with TransUnion and the direct ability for TransUnion through that TLOXP tool gives them direct access to your data. 
Now, that's a bit of a problem here. In one of the few well-documented cases of abuse of this transunion tool, Forbes covered how an amateur rap crew used it as part of a million-dollar fraud spree in 2018. That was years ago. Now, that's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? And talk in this channel that we were talking about here at 404 Media, in that channel over Telegram, is that the TLXOXP is the database that has really caught on by the criminal underground. Now, that, that's obviously a very, very big problem. They've got all of this stuff, okay? Uh, the, the criminals also mentioned using some different companies in these telegram, telegram groups that they claim to use, DataTrack, SearchBug, US Info, Info Search. Now, again, there's tools that are made available to skip tracers, people who try and find you, creditors, etc., who you might owe money to, and they want to know where you're at, and so they want to be able to find your, your relations and go talk to them, put the squeeze on them, right? data brokers who are supplying data to private investigators, right? So the PI is their customer, and they'll go and do on-site visits, et cetera, right? It, it, it's really something, okay? So do you want to know what they, they do to qualify you as a private investigator? Well, they'll go on-site to the private investigator's office, and then they'll make sure they have a locked filing cabinet and a shredder to properly handle records. All right. Now, DataTrack said at the time of the criminal gaining access to this massive data trove from the credit agency, all the company did was a remote confirmation where the applicants asked to provide various pieces of identity and security verification virtually rather than in person so you can see all of the holes in this it's it's just crazy when you start really digging into it and this goes on and on now let's talk about protecting yourself because once your data is out there and unfortunately most of our data is because these credit bureaus did not keep our data safe and if you were part of the class action suit you know you might have gotten literally a few bucks but the and you had to prove, by the way, that you had spent all of this time and spent all of this money to try and recover your identity. Uh, so uh, hopefully you kept good records of those 300 hours that are estimated in order to recover everything. But even then, they won't give you money for your time just for any direct cost. Like if you hired someone like a private investigator to do a little bit more for you. Right. It, a racket, a racket. 200 plus million people, their data was stolen. And, and does Equifax fire anybody? Does anybody go to jail? No, 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 no. Now, there's a company out there that I have been asked about before. It's called Delete Me. Seems to be a pretty decent company. 404 Media talks about it here in this uh, in this uh, article. And they have new services all of the time over at Delete Me. And some are a little better than others. But the problem is we're talking about a game of whack-a-mole your data is out there it's on the dark web it may be available for free and you can check that by the way yourself for free by going to have i been pwned.com have i been pwned.com great site trustworthy site troy hunt runs it uh, check it out have i been pwned.com so you can see if your data is out there on the dark web Obviously, out there in the dark web, right? Right. There may be places that Troy isn't aware of, but but how do you get the credit bureaus to stop selling your information? It can be really, really difficult. So a lot of people have turned to Delete Me. It's not a total waste, but it's frankly almost impossible to have them delete everything about you entirely. 
Yeah, and you know here, here, that's a problem, right? Because according to Delete Me's Gilmore, he said that the credit bureaus will not remove you from the data sets, but they will not sell it in certain conditions. And the bureaus make it really onerous to try and get out of there. They never purge the header data. And that's the data that they're selling, by the way, the header data, which has all kinds of personal information on you. Header data sounds so innocent, doesn't it? But it's not. That's the data that has all of this information that the fraudsters need. It might not have detailed information. But, of course, that tool that we are just talking about does have all of that information in it as well that are being used uh, by the bad guys, that TLO XP tool. So almost impossible to remove. You can check out Delete Me. It's probably a good idea for you to do that. There needs to be more regulation here because this is our private information. And once it's gone, we're never going to get it back. And I I don't know. I I don't think it's too late for you, but it it, it might be. But, you know, you got to do something, right? So how do you protect yourself from doxing? Well, first of all, try and get the credit bureaus to remove your data from their systems or at least to stop selling it. So you got to contact all three of the major credit reporting bureaus. Uh, you need to go in and to your social media accounts and you need to make sure that your profiles, your usernames are private so that people aren't going to be able to find you. That's terrible, but neither are the bad guys. Obviously, remove any addresses, places of work, specific locations from your accounts, anything that helps to identify you. Do not have it in any, in any of your settings and also do not have uh, any posts with any of that information. We've talked before about how it's a problem for people to post, hey, I'm going on vacation next week, uh, because the bad guys might be watching that, right? They might be targeting you, the business you work for, the business you own. Uh, set your post to friends only. And just those simple things are going to go a long way. But check it out online. You'll find it uh, again at 404media.co. Make sure you're on my email list, get my weekly emails, and you will be in front of all of this nastiness. As my wife constantly says, the cloud is just a word for another person's computer. And a computer that you don't control is what I really add on to that. Microsoft 365 being a really great example. Microsoft has what they call a shared responsibility for your data. And a lot of people just assume, hey, I'm paying Microsoft, uh, whatever it is, 10, 20, 30 bucks a month for my email account and SharePoint and my Teams rooms and everything else. So I'm all set, right? And of course, the answer to that is no, yet you are not all set. The Microsoft user agreement does not provide that they are not going to lose your data, that your data is not going to be ransomed. And there are a number of cases, I was just doing a search online, where they're talking about how Microsoft really messed up and they've had a lot of lawsuits over it where they lost data. Now, one of the things, too, that it can be a real problem when you get right down to it is the backup of the data. Microsoft will kind of more or less maybe keep your data around, your emails uh, around, your files, the things in your OneNote and OneDrive. But in reality, a lot of that stuff is not any, it does not have any sort of guarantee from Microsoft. And they do lose it. In, In fact, they lost from one of the big accounting firms records of thousands of their employees and of course their customers those employees customers and microsoft wasn't going to do anything about it because they don't 
do anything like that. The other real thing that's confusing about the Microsoft 365 stuff is the uh, the levels that they have, right? They have a whole bunch of different business levels, you know, enterprise and regular users, and they all come with different abilities, including you can get more in security if you want it. And, and then, you, of course, you've got to configure it all and set it all up. But Microsoft 365 has become just incredibly commonplace in business. Now, what we do for our customers is I go in and we have a backup program that we run in our own owned data center. So your data, your data, right? Our customers' data never leaves our hands. But we run these programs that go out to Microsoft 365 and pull down everything, all of the information from Microsoft 365, and then store it locally. And we have had to do restores for our customers. Now, somewhere around 80% of the time, apparently, it's a user that messed up. They deleted a whole bunch of stuff. And Microsoft does have the ability to do restores, which is good, right? And those restores are hopefully okay. But the restores are just of deleted emails or deleted files, and they're only kept for about 30 days. It kind of depends on your license and what the data is. And if you don't notice it for more than 30 days, you're completely out of luck. The same thing's true when it comes to lawsuits on some of this stuff, okay? So it's very, very uh, commonplace for people to use Microsoft 355, 365, but the businesses and individuals don't realize what they're getting into, right? The basics are not covered when it comes to cloud backup and recovery. And Microsoft is not giving you any sort of a warranty about losing your data. And what happens if they get ransomed, which can happen, there's no question about it. So you can't count on Microsoft yet again, right? I'm not a Microsoft fan. You guys already know that. But uh, they've come a long ways, so that's a good thing from Balmer days and Bill Gates days. But there's two hard truths that you really need to consider here when you're planning on using the cloud. And I've been talking about Microsoft and picking on them, but it's true for any cloud service. It can be anything. It could be Salesforce.com, many, many others. You have to make sure you step up and accept the responsibility for the safekeeping of your data. That means you've got to go through, configure it as safely as you can, and then you've got to download your data and put all of your data somewhere locally so that you have it somewhere hopefully safe and encrypted locally, right? All of that stuff's true. And if you don't keep it safe, well, you know, it's your fault. It's kind of what it boils down to. So shared responsibility is just crazy. Because if you're trusting Microsoft to do this, you could lose access to your intellectual property, right? Your patent information, legal information, accounting information. You might no longer be in compliance if you're in a regulated industry, if you've lost access to certain information. If the entire company loses access to emails, there's an attorney who sued Microsoft for $1.75 million, a guy out of New Jersey, because Microsoft had blocked him out of his email. So he could not correspond with the courts or with his clients. So now there's a potential problem here of ethical violations. Yeah, I, I know. Attorneys and ethics, right? Yeah, okay, I get it. You don't have to point that out. Uh, but they they were, they were for months, uh, blocked him from getting in, and he called their tech support people. I did that for one of my clients that had lost a lot of emails, that spam was being sent out from their, their tenant, and just a terrible, terrible situation. And so we opened a ticket with Microsoft, and we spoke to a really nice guy at Microsoft, and... He knew nothing about any of this stuff. And uh, frankly, I think he was just kind of, you know, trying to give us a hug and help us along. They never resolved any of the issues ever. 
It's crazy. And we reached out to them two more times. I did personally. And we never got any resolution from them. The most recent one, and I've just given up on her, is a lady who claims to be calling me, right? And so the phone rings. I answer the phone. Hello, hello, hello. And after 30 seconds, she hangs up. And so I send an email saying, what's going on here? Oh, I tried calling. Okay, well, call back again. Because I, I'd already filed two other tickets. Microsoft was able to reach me at that phone, no problem. I know there's no problem with the phone. So a couple of days later, she calls back, of course, after 5 p.m., thinking I'm not going to be working. And I answer the phone, hello, 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 this is Craig, hello. And she hangs up again. And I never did end up resolving anything with her and you can't report them right I, I have a daughter who runs a major call center and this is a problem that they've had too where people will call and the person answering the phone doesn't want to talk i just don't feel like it today and so they do the same thing they just sit there with their microphone on mute waiting for the caller to hang up and in my case i hung up once after 30 seconds of saying hello in the other case she hang up hung up on me and then the third case well she's just left a voicemail it's so annoying but they fire people like that ultimately right they have to put them on report and blah 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 so you could lose the entire company access could lose to uh, emails sharepoint other apps salesforce is based on multiple automations that have been built into microsoft and those are going to have to be rebuilt it just it just goes on and on so it, it's a word of warning uh, this whole quote shared responsibility thing means it isn't shared microsoft is pushing the responsibility for the safety and security of your data on you and again that's true for most of the cloud back or not cloud backup but the cloud providers out there so keep an eye on that if you are using cloud anything all right um, online backup for Microsoft 365 is crazy important. Now, ransomware is expected to reach $1.75 trillion in payouts 2025. Isn't that something? Microsoft 365, as of right now, is somewhere around 300 million users. You can tell by that they're making a whole lot of money, aren't they? on their Microsoft 365. Uh, but you've got to be careful, too, because what if you have insider threats? What if you end up in a lawsuit? Do you have access to the email accounts from people that no longer work for you? Right? It, it, there's so many things to consider, and there, there's some good advice you can find online. You can poke around. If you want some more advice, as always, just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. I am here to help, no question. I'll help anybody. We'll get on a phone call. Uh, I'm not going to charge you for it because I don't want you to get into these really, really tough positions that so many people have been, you know, have frankly found themselves in over the years. So important stuff there. Now, I also was talking about the Kennesaw State University election hacks. This is in Georgia. And this is very, very detailed. Uh, it's an article from the Gateway Pundit. And it talks in detail about how the election machines were hacked. And the Kennesaw State University had them, knew they were hackable, and that they had been hacked, and they reported it to the FBI, who really didn't pay any attention. Apparently, this is according to the article in the Gateway Pundit, the FBI never even looked into it. They closed the case without any consideration. Just crazy. Tons of security holes. Uh, EVs, the Biden administration now, they are going to be buying cobalt, which is a rare earth mineral that's needed to make electric vehicles, as well as many other battery powered things by using child labor, child labor in unsafe mines. Uh, and then I've got a great article that I put up on my website, important for business people. 
about securing your data, keeping the business safe. I've broken it down to some nice, simple steps. CraigPeterson.com. You'll see it if you dig in past the homepage. All right, everybody, sign up right now. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. Take care.